And there's a lot of stuff that's been in the news this week with celebrities, with whether it be Heather Locklear, whether it be um, somebody that you got interviewed on, which was yeah, uh, I got Moore. interviewed uh, by People Magazine and um, E Online this week uh, about Demi Moore. Um, and I thought it was kind of tragic, actually, about a lot of the interviews that were going on. It seems like every time um, a celebrity gets in trouble, everybody, most of the talking heads out there, jump on this bandwagon of, you know, trying to, you know, tear them down and say what's wrong with them when they don't know the client, they've never met the client. Right. There seems to be a certain lack of respect for privacy. Um, well, that, that's and, another know. question. If you are, so, you know, if you if you chose in that life. That's yeah, where but, you hard. know, there's a time and a place for everything. That's, right. that's sort of my point. You know, yeah. like right when somebody's getting trouble or in trouble and getting help, that's the most sensitive time for them. And when, why why spend hours and hours on TV speculating Conject, what's wrong right. with somebody? Uh, and, you know, save that for Barbara Walters, you know, when they're better. You know, like uh, people have a right to be... To get know, help. Get and help and freely without being chased around. And Well, I think there's something that's know. important about what you're talking about because we, we, you know, we had a posting on our Facebook page. And if you, you know, go to Clean Radio, you know, on Facebook. And it was very interesting with somebody just, you know, basically saying, why do they need insurance? Right. You know, why, do, why, why shouldn't she just have to pay? Right, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if that was the intent. I mean, I think it was an honest question. Right. Like, why do rich people have to have insurance? Right, and I, I think I answered it. You and did, I was, yeah. The, you know, most people in our country don't have enough money to uh, afford a cat catastrophic medical event. Right, um, and so they need insurance to cover that event, just to even get access to health care. Right, um, rich people use it as a way to mitigate or lessen the blow of, of what might be a large financial cost. So if you get cancer or something and the treatment's $2 million, it's worth it to pay for health insurance. What they, people don't know is that there's high deductibles with you know, great coverage after a certain amount. So if you have a lot of money, you can pay like 20, 000, have a $20,000 deductible and then get 100% coverage for everything above $20,000. So it's just a wealth management, uh, you know, hedge insurance. And I also think it's important to talk about because people see Demi Moore or Demi Moore, however you pronounce it, and they're like, you know, she's, they look at her, I think a lot of times people, you know, look at people that are wealthy or people that come from good families and go, how could you have a problem? Right. You know, how could you have so much money? How could you have it? You know, not realizing that addiction, because I think a lot of people in America still look at the alcoholic or the drug addict as the person in Skid Row. Yeah. They don't realize that it's every, it, you know, it's the guy sitting next to you. It's your son. It's your daughter. It doesn't. Yeah. I mean, often the hardest people to treat are the people that have a lot of financial means. Uh, it's harder for them to bottom out. Uh, you know, it's harder for other people to force them into treatment. Um you know, denial is such a strong aspect of addiction that uh, people that are often addicted uh, don't even realize it. You know, um, I'm dealing with that right now with a couple of friends uh, and people that I know that are beginning to have major consequences from the use of alcohol, and yet they don't realize it themselves. They're still trying to blame other people or try to find other excuses as to why they ended up in the hospital and blacked out. You right. Know? And, um, so it, it's just it just amazes me actually you know and like they say in AA you know cunning baffling and powerful powerful you know it's it's true this is a, the, an illness that is affects people and it, it's very very difficult. Right. And we are a show about you know part of the problem in the media stories you know you know I've needs. And but we're never you know you know you're not really always shown the success stories because that's not where the glamour in it. But there is hope. Oh, there's a lot of hope, and that's what I really right. like about our show is that right. you know we have people come on that have gotten sober yeah. and doing well. So and yeah. what's the number if people are in you know here's the deal. I mean we, we you know clean treatment you know clean and clean treatment center. You give away a lot of beds. You yeah, know, I actually uh, is. As part of opening the tr uh, treatment center, I originally uh, said that I would give away two free beds, which is 10% of our beds at all times. So right. we have uh, two free beds on ongoing all the time right. um, for the community, which I think is really important. And I encourage every treatment center to do that throughout the country. I agree. And if there's anybody out there tonight, you know, uh, obviously we're in a rough time in our society right now with economics. And it, it's, it's, it's so crazy how you think about it. It's like we're going through this depression. We're going through a recession. So people are drinking more. They're using more. And then so they're they're doubly in trouble because they can't even afford to get into a re you know it's like 
they they can't get out of trouble. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think I profess to be a libertarian on the yeah. show before, so I guess I'll stick with that. Yeah. No, but <laughs> I'm, I'm saying you're offering on, help to people. I'm not people. big on, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I was, I, the, did you see the State of the Union address? Uh, I tried not to. You tried not to? Yeah. I, you, I think you would have been impressed. Okay. You know, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, Obama doesn't act more often like he did at the State of the Union address. Well, that's I, the problem with speeches. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> you can uh, talk a lot, but it's not action, right? And so. the number here, by the way, is 888-458-5441. 888-458-5441. We're sorry if the show's a little choppy tonight. We're uh, in mid-studio uh, transition. Transition. But we have an amazing guest tonight. Um, he's, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'll let him tell you about what he does, but his name is Cadillac Ron. He's got an amazing story. He's an amazingly talented musician. And I was, you know, he informed me outside that he goes on these all across America, what is it, and does these rap contests. And uh, welcome to Clean Radio, Cadillac Ron. You're also going to be going through some technical difficulties like me. How you doing, man? Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little about yourself. Well, uh, for those people that, uh, I mean, for anyone that doesn't know me, you know, I'm a, what we call an underground rapper in uh, the Los Angeles area. And by that, I just mean, you know, I haven't uh, broken through on a mainstream level. But uh, to us, like in the underground, that doesn't really matter anyway. We're like our own thriving artistic community. And uh, I'm basically at the forefront of the new generation of rappers in the West Coast, which is kind of taking back the coast and taking back w what is ours as the culture of hip hop music. And uh, it's been so watered down by commercialization and mainstream media that uh, at some point the message was lost. And so it's my job and the job of my comrades to basically take it back and make it correct. So that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I'm from the L.A. area originally, from Hollywood, Hancock Park area. And uh, I'm really glad, at, you know, to be coming on the show. It's like we're talking about the battle rap world, um, which is like a big part of what I do. And uh, it's really funny because, you know, we know who we're going to battle for. Like, we might find out a couple months in advance and then we go to do the battle. And typically what I get attacked for the most is my drug history. You know, that's like the, the ammunition is like endless, and that's what everybody. I so. was actually going to ask you about that because I was I would assume that there's a lot of addiction in that area. You mean in the, the, the hip hop? In the hip hop community. and the. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's probably not as I mean, it's kind of different as, as far as like. Uh, well, there's a glamorization of dealing drugs, right? I mean. I think it, yeah. I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, there's. I'd say there's certain drugs that are specific to the the culture. You know, like obviously like marijuana. I don't know if we can like say drug names on the yeah, air. Absolutely. But yeah, uh, you, talk about you know, right now a lot of kids are abusing the uh, promethazine and codeine cough syrup, which has been popularized by southern rappers. You right. know, and actually people are dying from it. You know, like uh, rest in peace to Pimp C and DJ Screw. These are individuals who actually died from abusing prescription cough syrup. Well, they're probably mixing it with alcohol, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, and just drinking it in such large quantities because they right. can afford it. But, uh, you know, it's like uh, in any music or artistic environment, drugs kind of go hand in hand with that, unfortunately. Or fortunately for those people that can, you know, take it or leave it as they see fit, you know. Uh, and then there's some of us that, you know, take it too far and then, you know, have to go clean up for a while. And those are the people, like you guys are talking about, that end up, like on the front pages of you know and there's a lot of people that don't end up getting right. written about <laughs> most people don't get <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, you know yeah, you know yeah, so. I mean, we talk a lot about um the difficulty or you know the that that myth or, or or the allure and the idea that you know drug and drug use and the creative arts and especially music um are so connected you know if you look through your record collection you can almost see what drugs were in favor by what music was popular at the time um, that's and, better, yeah. Right? That's, yeah. I mean, you know, like. It's so, actually pretty amazing that you say that. You're right, because as, from acid to. Well, look at how trance right. and, you know, uh, electronica was brought on by ecstasy. Right. And it killed alcohol off as drug of choice. And, you know, all of a sudden you had raves open up and bars and clubs and rock clubs just disappeared overnight. I, I, can I say I don't get raves? Can, can you explain me a rave? Because I, I just don't get it. We were just at one on Friday night, actually, okay. and it was. Uh, we were there with the Makina Muerte boys, and it was uh, 
I didn't really get it either, but yeah. it was probably like being sober and being there was like actually really fun, you right. know, because I mean, I could just see like we kept saying like, wow, if we were if we were on acid, this right. would probably be like really intense because well, you, know? you need it right the only way you could enjoy it is by being on and we were talking about the other day it used to drive me nuts remember the movie natural born killers oh yeah and everybody afterwards they're like, i was because i was like i didn't get it and they're like you don't understand you had to be on something to get it and i was like it can't be that good of a movie if i needed to be on something right. to get it well i think some of these things are created to prime and accentuate the use of certain drugs right i mean glow sticks obviously right. to create trails when you're like you know high in ecstasy or lsd right. i mean you know it's part of drug culture and to intensify the effect the tribalism sort of aspect of ecstasy and lsd in a rave you know uh that's what it's going for and um mdma especially that releases people and makes them feel loving without sort of any inhibitions is perfect for that type of environment so it makes sense that human beings you know we're really great at making something extra 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 concentrated right like we take a regular pepper and we turn it into hot sauce that causes a blister in your mouth and you put like one drop in your yeah, mouth it didn't start right? like that <laughs> yeah it didn't start like that that took a lot of a lot of specialized uh -huh. crossbreeding and and hybridization, right? I mean, look at marijuana. We've gone from what was like a you know a, a, a plant to make rope out of with very low THC levels to you know hybrid you know levels of um, you know insane strains that will right. make you hallucinate for four hours. So um, you know it's a different world. But I think that you know that's what what's going on. You get something like ecstasy that creates a certain type of response, and then you develop a whole cultural surrounding around that drug to try and intensify the effect. Um, unfortunately, you know these drugs are unregulated, so things like ecstasy in particular, you know you see dehydration and people passing out. People don't know how to use the drug properly. Um, if there's really a proper way to use it, but even in the way we're using it recreationally, they don't know how to stay hydrated properly, or they get. Well, a lot of this, this is something else people don't know is that a lot of people die from taking ecstasy and then drinking too much water. Right. So, you know, it's just it's just a dangerous drug to take, and um, uh, you know we've been seeing it in high schools and other places where it just you know it just seems like a little young for people to be even experimenting with stuff like that. So. Well, you see, you see, like the drug trends that permeate the hip hop culture as well. I mean, like uh, when ecstasy got really popular in the Bay Area, in particular, like this rapper Mac Dre. Actually, one of his aliases was Thizel Washington, and Thiz is slang for ecstasy. Hmm. So all these kids started talking about Thiz, and you had kids that typically wouldn't be exposed to ecstasy, like a lot of gang members who weren't going to raves. All of a sudden. Or taking ecstasy because Mac Dre is saying, you know, ecstasy right. is really cool. So yeah, I think you'd say the same thing with LSD and the Beatles, right? I mean, it's really not that much different. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, it's I guess it's just a product of culture and you know, drug culture mixing with popular culture. But I think it's also an important thing to talk about is like, you don't need these things to create. And uh, I mean, we're, we've all in here created. You know, you you've created. Well, I guess that's really our question yeah. to Joe here is like, you know, you get slammed for getting sober, right? In these rap battles. Kind right? of like wrong. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. And um, what did I say? Joe. Joe. Oh, I'm losing my mind. Yes. It's, it's, see what happens if you... By the way, you're listening to Clean... <laughs> by the way, you are listening to Clean Radio. We are live. Um... I don't know where we're live right now, but we're live somewhere. Uh, you might somewhere be listening. Yeah, you might be listening to us in San Diego. You might be listening to us online at cleanradio.com. Uh, you could also find us on Facebook at Clean Radio. Give us a call tonight. It's 888-458-5441. That's 888-458-5441. If we hit any sna snafus, we're sorry, but we're in the studio tonight with actually and it just this is really cool. We're in the studio tonight with Cadillac Ron, who what do you call it a battle rapper? I, I'm just a rapper, right. but uh, like as of probably 2009, I'm probably most known for my involvement in a battle league called Grind Time, right. which uh, originated in Orlando, Florida, and then was popularized by my uh, my friend Lush One from Oakland. I love these names that you're you're just like throwing out there, Pimp C, Lush One. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, Lush got involved and kind of made the West Coast kind of the mecca for good battle rap and that's kind of where i came to prominence in you know the last few years and uh 
it's what it's done like uh, most of the good battles go viral on YouTube and right. people that otherwise a lot of talented people musicians that hadn't been exposed to a, a mass market you know all of a sudden their battle videos are getting 50 to 100,000 in some cases a million views wow. and all of a sudden you know you get recognized in the airport and you go to parties and kids you know uh, you know, in, incidentally, visiting people in treatment facilities and detoxes, getting recognized by patients, you know, so. And uh, I don't hide anything about my history. Like, I'm very blunt. My music is all about pr pretty much what it was like, you know, and. Uh, so what drugs were your drugs of cho choice? I'm or a, are I your mean, drugs of choice when you're using? I would say uh, I, I'm, I'm most widely known as a. Uh, one of, like two of my aliases is the Black Tar Rap Star. That's right. that's. I love these names. Yeah. You gotta write them down for me. And uh, so I could like go to neighborhoods, you know, and be like, I know Pimp C O. <laughs> Judy, you still get your ass. Yeah, I would. <laughs> but, uh, yes, that's true. Okay, but, sorry, uh, go yeah, on. no, it's cool. Um, so, like, uh, I started making music about heroin probably in like around 2002. Right. And uh, my my lyrics were very dark, just about. You know, being a heroin addict, more or less. Mm -hmm. I was like uh, the Gigi Allen or Kurt Cobain of rap music. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of rap musicians that were even like addicted to heroin weren't talking about being addicted to heroin. So all of a sudden, kids that really are strung out were hearing my music. And, you know, I'd be on tour or at shows and people would come up to me like, you know, confiding in me about their problems and or relate. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't go on Facebook without somebody popping in to talk to me about being a heroin addict. And wow. more often than not, they're they're still in the in the throngs of the disease, and they want to talk about, you know, how I got sober or how bad it was. Or so tell us a little bit about that. How did you get sober? Um, or why did you choose to get sober? Well, it was like it was a combination of things. That, like uh, in the early two thousands, my drug use had progressed to like such an insane level, where um, you know, and I, we we're talking about ecstasy, acid. Like I grew up doing all of that, like in excess. I mean. Right. I was a drug addict from Jump Street, you know, and, um, you know, I told my parents when I was 15 years old, like, I'm going to smoke marijuana till the day I die, you know, that was, right. and I believed that, you know, yeah. that was, like, for life. Um, once, like, Oxycontin and prescription pain medication came into play, I was at school in the Northwest in Portland, Oregon, hmm. and uh, my friends and I up there became severely addicted to painkillers. Were you and just orally taking them, or we were snorting oxycontin snorting, at the time? Oxy. Yeah, this was right when oxys were first coming on the black market, like ninety nine, two thousand. Right. And uh, I mean, they might have been there before, but they hadn't hit. You know, there wasn't like Time Magazine writing articles about them. You know, a lot of people right. don't realize that that's what people do. They start taking them orally, then they snort them, and then they start injecting them. Sure. So but to get the right, so the high yeah. becomes better. Absolutely. Well, the, the goal is to get the biggest punch as soon as possible. Right. So, and uh, if you swallow them, it takes longer to have it it gets more first of all it disperses more slowly right um and over a longer period of time i had a friend that used to shoot vodka yeah yeah why not I mean, yeah. yeah yeah but um so we like we had all sold drugs well, i can tell you why not but yeah i get right all right, right. <laughs> but i get your point yeah but um you know like we whatever drug was popular in college at the time we'd sell and then i noticed though with the oxycontin there was this desperation. The kids really came all, all hours of the night. They wanted more, and I'd never even done it. Long story short, got strung out, came back to L.A., hmm. and uh, my heroin addiction took off from there because we couldn't get oxys out here, so we started buying heroin on the streets. How much How much oxy do you think it took before you were strung out? Like, Oh, I was strung out. It was, it was a remarkable. I mean, because up until that point, I wouldn't have considered myself to have a drug problem. Even right. though I was abusing drugs, I was definitely... The, the guy that did way too much, party way too hard. Drugs were affecting my life and my health probably, but I hadn't crossed that line. It was becoming physically dependent to opiates right. changes you forever. I mean, yeah. there's no going back. It's like, you. it's really like they talk about, you know, this magic line in the sand where when you realize you're physically addicted, it's totally different. Because I smoked crack my whole life, you know, I was, right. and I could stop for weeks at a time or go somewhere else and not buy, if I didn't know where there was crack there, I'd be all right. Right. You know, someone told me they had crack. I'd smoke it, but... Right. Well, crack, <laughs> crack, I mean, crack's right. obviously very psychologically addicting. Right. Well, in, I mean, when you're in... It that physical withdrawal effect. Yeah, I mean, uh, so. like, the phenomenon of craving for co crack cocaine exists, like, very profoundly within me. Like, I right. can't stop once I start, but... Yeah, explain that to people listening. I remember a lot of people that are listening to the show tonight don't know what the phenomenon of craving By means. By that, I mean, what I'm saying is, like... Uh, 
the, 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 the simplest terms, you know, is that once you start, you can't stop. Your body, if it's developed uh, ad addiction, you know, um, if you have crossed the line over to the, you know, become a drug addict, it means once you put something in your system, your body reacts in like an almost allergic fashion and you, you need more drugs. You, right. Your body actually right. craves more liquor and more cocaine or more whatever. Just right. doesn't you know? want to stop. Which yeah. is like pretty cool because how many, incredible, because how many people say, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> right. 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 And it's like they, when they say it, they truly mean in their head, I'm just going to do this one thing. But the second. Well, I love the old Chinese saying, the drink takes it, or the man takes a drink, the drink takes, takes a drink, oh. and the drink takes the man. Right. It's yeah. exactly right. You know, I think, but, you know, obviously with other substances, it takes you a lot harder than. Just three drinks. Right, but people <laughs> really mean it when they say it. That's that's the cunning, baffling, and powerful thing that right. we uh, what you're talking about. And the people about. that aren't drug addicts don't understand, right. and that don't have sympathy for people once they're at that point of addiction. Right, because they can't they can't understand. Like it's right. but and it's like we were talking about this last week with consequences. You know, if somebody's willing to shoot a needle in their arm, and and literally at that moment risk dying. What are you going to punish that person with? Right. <laughs> and and how could you be mad at somebody that's willing to kill themselves at that moment? I, I mm -hmm. get how you can be mad, but that's something to think about. If you're willing to inject your arm with something that could kill you 10 cents later or give you a great high, that person is obviously sick. I think the anger that we see from people that are angry at addicts, or are ang they're angry because they love and care about that person and they feel helpless. Right. And the only feeling that really comes up generally is anger. And, you know, They don't know how to deal. They're angry that they don't know how to help or deal or that that person can't help or deal with, with it themselves at that time. Yes, yeah, that powerless feeling, you're yeah. right. It's, it's, it's that. Yeah. We actually got a call in line too. Why don't we take the call? No? I, no. We're having another technical we're, problem. It's okay. It's we're our having, night of technical I think we're doing problems. amazingly well for having <laughs> all these technical difficulties. We have three addicts in the studio, and we're dealing with technical... Now, that's progress. Right. <laughs> and we're in the studio tonight. You're listening to Clean Radio Live. We're in the studio tonight with uh, Cadillac Ron. What do you got coming up? I know you have... You were telling me about... You have albums coming out. Yeah, actually, my brother and I just finished uh, a record we've been working on for quite some time, and... Uh, it's it's actually called times is hard and uh it's kind of a throwback to it's basically a record about the worst time of my life and it's 13 songs about uh being kind of spiritually bankrupt and uh wow. it's it's actually it's pretty deep i listened to it all for the first time last night alone in my car at night at like three in the morning and uh, i think that's how it's meant to be heard is i mean this is a record where I mean, already people relate to my music on such an insane level. Like, but uh, this is one for those people that are that are sitting at home, staring at the walls, that you know probably want to kill themselves. Right. Like, and they could hear this and at least know that someone else experienced that and that someone else has gone through what they've gone through. And we talk, it's jails, institutions, and near death experiences throughout the album. But there's lots of moments of levity where you know I am able to shed light. Like we laugh about it. You know, it's. Uh, there's a, a lot of songs on the surface would appear to be almost happy songs, but we're talking about being incarcerated. we got to go out to a break real quick. Um, we'll uh, talk more about it. You're on Clean Radio. Uh, we'll be back in uh, after a couple of short breaks and uh, talk to you in a second. suspect a loved one is abusing drugs? Call Clean Treatment Center at 888-601-6040 for a free drug test and consultation. A treatment advisor is available to help you administer the test and answer any questions you may have regarding treatment and more. We are here to help. Call us today at 888-601-6040 or find us online at cleantreatmentcenter.com for your free drug test and the start of a promising future. Back to Andrew and Judah. Hey, welcome back to Clean Radio. Uh, I think we got most of our technical difficulties worked out. So uh, you have a lot more faith than I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> give them the number. Our number for our calling in tonight is eight 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 four five eight five four four one. That's eight 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 four five eight five four four one. And. To and to anybody that's going to be listening to the show later, Andrew and I are not mentally challenged. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so there were some... <laughs> well, I'm mentally challenged, but hopefully yeah. at a higher level. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't, don't, you're not. Um, and we're a show about addiction and recovery, and uh, there have been a lot of topical things going on lately. 
And it's, it's you know, we have Demi Moore in the news. We have had Heather Locklear in the news. And, you know, our guest in the studio tonight is Cadillac Ron. It's something very interesting he spoke about was most people don't make the news. You know, right. that's the thing about addiction. You know, Bon Jovi, not, I don't mean to get you bad with Bon Jovi since he's like, you know, the, the total opposite. But he had a great line in one of his songs. He said, as I dream about movies they won't make of me while I'm dead. Hmm. And um, I always love that line. Yeah, I think uh, it's kind of a trip. I mean, especially being a drug addict, being an artist, uh, there's this kind of mentality with a lot of people I know that aren't even famous, you know, and it's uh, that, you know, they're going to die this glamorous drug death, right. you know, and be Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Amy Winehouse, you know. Who, who died the most un uh, unromantic Right, who are choking deaths, on their own vomit in yeah. the hotel. And, Dying in, in tubs, in people. France, you know, but... Um, it's it's tough because like there is that kind of you know it's hard not to shoot heroin in L.A. and think you're living in a Red Hot Chili Peppers video you know it's like <laughs> riding the bus while you're high you know becomes like this is what it's all about right. you know it's just me in L.A. and we have this like crazy incestuous relationship and you know I remember like the best day of my life being in a Rite Aid bathroom you know and then the next day the worst day of my life was in a Rite Aid bathroom hmm. you know and it's like uh, you know we were talking a little bit about um, you know, what happened, I guess, in terms of, you mentioned in consequences, it's like, there comes a point, I believe, where, you know, pain is the great teacher, and if, if your pain has to be greater than the rush that you get when you shoot the dope, you know, and uh, my ex-wife, you know, she, she told me at one point she was going to do two years in prison, and she said, you know, there was nothing in the world that was better than the rush, and two years in prison is nothing to compare to that rush, you right. know, and she was willing to do that, you know, and then that was, that was nothing to her, you know, we're willing to die for, you know, we were watching a documentary about this new drug in Russia called yeah. Crocodil. Yeah. We were discussing that last yeah. week and uh, people, uh, it like makes your legs fall yeah. off. You know, like if you, if you inject it, you like your, le your limbs literally like deteriorate. Yeah. You get gangrene. Yeah. And, instantly. And, like, and it just, you just, if you're, it's gross. You can yeah. see the pictures on, uh, you can Google it's it. Horrible. And, yeah, it's horrible. We unbelievable. do, we do have a call, uh, David in San Diego. David, are you there, David? I am. Welcome hey, to David. Clean Radio. And, hey, I uh, just want to say, yeah. uh, it's, it's fantastic, uh, the service that you're doing. Thank and you. that young man, Ron, too, uh, you guys are truly amazing. Thank but you. I, the comment that I wanted to, to make is that we, what we do is we treat the symptom, and the symptom is fear, and we, and we treat it with drugs and alcohol right. abuse or gambling. And when we understand it, that, that it arises from fear and, um, that because we want to be happy. And, and when we do the drug, whatever we're doing, it eliminates, it eliminates the fear so we become happy. Once we realize that we can be happy without the drug and there's truly nothing to fear where we are, um, and, and I'm sure... Ron understands this through his spirituality. Once we begin to go within ourselves, we, we find a whole new world out there, and we find the cause is fear and the symptom is drug abuse. And I just would like to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think, I think that's a great point. I mean, I'll just say before Ron, it's, you just said something out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we were talking about that this week on Facebook, is that, you know, alcohol is but a symptom. What do you think, Ron? Yes. I mean, I'm a firm believer that if you, I think... Uh, you know, spiritual experience, if you can honestly face your fear and you can come, you know, in some moment of clarity, you can look at your fear, you know, whether it's through, you know, some spiritual practice or through writing fear inventories or however you're willing to deal with it. And you can be honest about what you're afraid of and face it head on. And obviously, you know, you're, you're growing and progressing in your spirituality. And, um, I think for me using drugs to combat fear, I, I'm, I, I agree with that, but I also, I also am a big proponent of the idea that, you know, I just was using drugs because I like the effects produced by drugs. And then at a certain point, I, I start to benefit from the, from that. And then I realize, okay, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not as afraid. I feel better when I do drugs. The effects, the yeah. byproduct of that is being able to combat my fears. So, yeah, I think, I think yeah, I, that, that, I guess that's the point I was making. I'm sorry. I'm on a sure. cell phone, so I, I got a little that. delay, but, but. I, but what, what I came about being an alcoholic and coming from a family of, um, you know, addicts was that once I began to go within, I began to have that same feeling, that, that feeling of euphoria that I had before I had to use drugs. Now, after quieting my mind and, and really going within and seeking the source of, of why I'm here, who I, why, what am I doing, 
when I come back out of that meditation, everything takes on like a, a really bitchin' kind of a feel. It's like, it truly is amazing. It's almost like doing a drug, although it takes some time to get to that point. You're right. That's, that's, that's like the point I was trying to make. Thank I, you very I, much for taking my call. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, it's it's some. we talked about this a little bit last week. It's like, what are the initial reasons that people use drugs? Like, I think we talked about a lot of it is to be in a peer group that, right. you know, has like the hot chick in it that they want to have sex with. And so that's, you know, they then that seems to be the drug culture. So they get involved that way. Or, you know, it's part of a music scene and you start taking drugs because of that. And then um, I think like some of the things like fear is more recovery language where once you've got so many consequences from having become addicted and using mm -hmm. that now all you, you've avoided a lot of things in your life that now keep you using and keep you out fear of withdrawal, fear of paying bills, fear of getting your life back together, fear of facing legal consequences. And I do like the, uh, the anacronym uh, face everything and recover for and fear. You can't give you the know? reverse one, though. Um, the reverse one? Yeah, it's it's face everything and recover, right. or the reverse way is the curse word. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and no, it's everything and run. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, which is the total opposite. But you're right. It's, it's, it's so funny because you're right. This is a lot of, um, you know, 12-step talk in a sense because when you're drinking, when you first start drinking, you're right. You love the effect that it has on you subconsciously then all of a sudden you realize okay if i'm drinking nobody puts expectations on me right you know if i'm using drugs i don't have to face the world you don't use start nobody says oh i want to take a drink today because i don't want to go to college next year <laughs> you know or you know my parents or you don't it's just oh my god everybody's having fun then all of a sudden life you don't have to deal with life right and that's that progression from use to abuse right. to addiction that we talk about right. so much on this show right Right. It's funny you say that because uh, there used to be that commercial where yeah. it said nobody says they want to be right. a junkie when they grow right. up. My dad, I think when I was in rehab for like the seventh time, he said, no, he did want to be a junkie. When <laughs> he you, know, you know who else said that? Bob Forrest was on our show, I think, in yeah. like our third episode. You can actually go back to cleanradio.com and look at that in the archives. Yeah. But he said it, like his ambition was to be a junkie. It was bizarre. Yeah. I mean, I got so into the counterculture movement, like... You know, electric Kool-Aid acid test was my Bible. You right. know, I gave a copy to my English teacher. And, uh, you know, with every drug I got into, I took it to, the, you know, we went through the Tony Montana phase. Right, right. Where we had our little pile of Coke and, you know, yeah. thought we were, you know, Cuban drug it. lord. And, yeah, uh, Bob you know, said he went, Bob Forrest from, from Celebrity Rehab and, all, and whatnot, he uh, said his goal was... Uh, to uh, be Keith Richards, you know, but, so. <laughs> but again, it was my goal once I, it wasn't my goal when I was eight. My goal when I was eight to 12 was to be on the show Wise Guy, was to be that guy, or it was to be the, these people I saw on TV and emulate them. It was once I started drinking that my goal was to be a successful alcoholic. Right. right. I don't remember, th I know it's cool to say later on, you know, into, even that's romanticizing and say, I always wanted to be a junkie. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. Because before you ever used, you didn't know what a junkie was. Right. Well, you didn't know the negative. Right. You didn't know. So just you know didn't, the, the romantic right. side of or it. Or even that, you didn't know. Right. I mean, you could. I mean, every kid. Every, they make those uh, the gum. You know, the gum for kids that you, you you blow on them and it powder comes out. Candy cigarettes. The candy cigarettes, right. right? So kids that are eight, I was smoking those, going, "This is cool," you know. But I, you didn't know at the point the effects. You're right of the of the long term right. effect ramifications of addiction right yeah so just tell us about like getting sober well uh like you know i started seeing a lot of the places that we start i started going to rehab when i was uh 22 years old mm. and i've been to 14 residential treatment programs wow, wow. cadillac so rock zagat guy to right. yeah, they <laughs> I actually have a song on the black tar rap star album called rehab legend and uh, maybe next time i'll okay. do it for you guys but uh yeah. it's uh it's uh so after being in rehab so many times, it, basically there was about three years of my life where I was either in rehab, incarcerated, or homeless. Hmm. And, uh, you know, which is all, you know, basically that kind of, now I can kind of like count my street credibility, to, to, you know, to that, you know, when people, anybody that asks about me, you know, they know about me all over, you know, you could, I'm verified, you know, so now that lends itself well to the, the rap scene, you know, because right. I'm like, I lived on Skid Row. I'm not from a particular neighborhood, you know, but I've existed in, in you know. You survived. Yeah, I mean, I'm from, yeah. the, it's a war zone down there. When I was down there, you know, the new police chief hadn't cleaned it up either. It was, you know, it was hell on earth. And uh, right. when kids talk about being homeless 
you know, I don't mean couch surfing. I mean sleep in the park. Don't know when you finally go to jail. Don't know whose clothes you're wearing, and come out of jail without shoes. You know, because when I'd go to jail, I'd throw my shoes away because they're usually in such bad shape. I knew I didn't want to put them back on. Right. So, and then uh, it was a series of those types of experiences where ultimately uh, I was in a treatment facility in South Central LA, and uh, that's kind of where I first really got the message of recovery. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not that I decided, oh, you know, I want to be sober. This is going to be a better thing for me to do. It was just kind of like, I don't want to go to rehab anymore. Right. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to go to jail. Uh, being homeless got really tiring. You know, the lifestyle was getting so, it was like, just, uh, I was really tired of living that way. And, uh. You know, I, I, I didn't want to deal with the consequences anymore. It just happened coincidentally that everybody that I knew whose lives had improved, you know, that it had drug problems, had maintained sobriety. And so that became, you know, okay, I could look at that. And that's something tangible. If I know how, if I see somebody I used to smoke crack cocaine with, you know, um, now their life's good. They have a job. They're employable. They have a girlfriend, you know, and I say, what did you do? They say, well, I'm in recovery. You know, and there was too many of those coincidences happening in my life. In my life, so it, inevitably, I ended up, you know, finding recovery, the recovery process, and just kind of jumping into it. And it sounds like it had nothing but a positive effect on your on your art. Yeah, I mean, there would be no Cadillac Braun if I mean, literally, I don't think I'd be here physically, but also, I mean, get, when I got sober. Uh, it was like provided me with this insane drive to kind of make up for lost time. Hmm. All of a sudden I realized like, you know, that I had to work harder than the kid who was 18 years old, you know, cause I was coming out of rehab hmm. at 25. You know, I run a treatment center and I hear that all the time. I hear, you know, especially people who are in their forties and they're just like, I can't believe I wasted like 20 years of my life and I don't even know where it went. Right. Well, I was yeah. like uh, determined to reverse that effect, and I, I made up for lost time crazy. We called it grinding, you know, and uh, that's all I did from the time I, I hit the streets in 06, I think, and I just nonstop. That was what I wanted to do my whole life was music, and, uh, you know, I started seeing payoff. Like, in a short period of time, I accomplished what few people have managed to accomplish, the most important of which was the respect of the people that I used to look up to, and today I can say, you know, I work with musicians today who, whose CDs I used to buy, you know, that I would, I could have never even imagined getting high in a radio station in Portland, Oregon, you know, saying to my friend Stephen Wood, like, listening to these guys' CDs, I never thought I'd be, you know, friends with them. Right. And now I have experiences like that all the time where I'm able to tour with musicians I used to look up to. Now we're, now we're all peers. Right. You know, I leveled the playing field, you know. What do you think about, like, where there's sort of this thing where, you know, so many musicians are getting sober in big bands, and yet they still have to sort of keep a mystique about not being sober? Like, I see that a lot. I mean, I, you know, even, you know, like all the guys from a lot of major bands right. are all sober. It's a great point you make, because I've always said, why can't still, they do, like, a sober doing, tour? Well, they're still, yeah, they're still doing the sex, drugs, rock right. and roll myth, you know? What, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, I'm guilty of that myself. I think, uh, you know, and uh, that's just like people come to expect a certain type of material. Like, I'm not gonna go out and write, you know, um, the recovery album, you know, right. like Eminem right. or whatever. Like, you know, what I'm, did you think of that album, by the way? To be honest, I never listened to it. Yeah. You know, um, I kind of preferred Eminem when he was more psychotic. You know, right. like he's a little too lucid for me now. But <laughs> by the way, you're listening to Clean Radio. Um, you could find us on Facebook at cleanradio.com. You're also listening to us on 760 AM San Diego and uh, 980 KFWB. Um, you could also find us Facebook, like us at Facebook on with a K, Clean Radio. Mm -hmm. We're in the studio tonight with uh, Cadillac Ron. The number here is 888-458-5441. That's 888-458-5441. Give us a call. Hey, Ken Lockrong, tell me about what it is. You talked about, like, the real integrity of uh, L.A. rap. Like, the, right. you know, bringing that back. What is that really about? Like, What I mean by that specifically is that, uh, like, we grew up, or I grew up listening to N.W.A., Easy e you know, Compton's Most Wanted, like uh, Cypress Hill, these groups that had some sort of street credibility in the sense, like, that they, they walked it like they talked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a certain point, 
there was kind of this conscious rap movement where it was kind of anybody, once Pro Tools came into effect, anybody could start a home studio and be a mediocre rapper. Right. Unfortunately, LA's got a lot of people. It's got a lot of really mediocre rappers in it. Then this whole pay-to-play system came into place with all the venues in the city, and the scene was just progressively watered down to the point where basically... There's, 90- no, there's no tastemakers anymore. No, everybody yeah, was any, horrible. Anybody can come in if they got the money. Yeah, if you can yeah. you can open for you know, Wu-Tang Clan if you if you give them 1500 bucks. Right. And, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah you can, yeah. You can open See, for anyone. It's the same thing in comedy, too. You, it's, you know, put, bring put your shows. Put 1500 bucks for me. I want to open for Wu-Tang. Oh, gosh. No. Yeah, <laughs> called, called Ju-Tang. <laughs> Ju-Tang's <laughs> opening for Wu-Tang. You know? yeah. and, uh, <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. Uh, you know what? I, I'll put up the 1500 bucks if uh, you could actually do it. I will. <laughs> okay, all right. So, it was like uh, there was a kind of this perfect storm of, of bad music, right. and then the the crew that I'm from, the collective of artists known as Maquina Muerte, was founded by uh, a guy named Isaiah Toothtaker from Tucson, Arizona, and Mestizo from out here. He's from all over, but the whole idea was basically to put together a group of artists who really represented the lifestyle that they talked about in their music or their art. Mm-hmm. And the majority of uh, the majority of us live art. And that's something like, I don't, you know, I don't turn on and turn off. Right. You know, Cadillac Ron is Cadillac Ron all the time. You know, it's not a character that I play in a movie. You know, I live my art to the you fullest. You have to have a real passion for it. Oh, it's my life. Yeah, yeah. You know, but and how uh, do you how do you take? Okay, so you're you're very obviously you're a very spiritual guy. Yes. You know, you're very in touch with your spiritual side. How do you deal with the community that people look at it? I mean, I I mean, I look at many of the rap community, or you know, is sort of a little dangerous, and. You see, Judah is a fear, a fearing Jew. Yes, I, you know, I think everybody. I think that's. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people look at rappers and they look at the violence. You know, you look at the that's, West Coast. Yeah, my, I mean, I'm, I'm going to an event a few weeks ago, and my mom and you know, I was telling her I was preparing for a battle, and there was some material in the battle which was very kind of edgy, you know, right. um, and she was work, expressed some concerns. You know, a lot of times there is violence surrounding the hip hop community, and uh, to be honest, like, um, you know. I'm not, a, you know, I don't walk on water all the time, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in people standing up for what they believe in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if that means, you know, you do what it takes. To, if you're defending something that's, you know, honorable, by all means, do that. I don't promote, you know, violence in the terms of like killing innocent people, women and children, you know, starting fights for no reason. You know, um, the the crew that I'm from has a reputation of actually being kind of like a, a little brolic, mm-hmm. as they say. Um, but it's that was kind of imp- important. It was kind of timed out well because the scene basically there was my integrity. I meant nobody was being held accountable for their actions anymore. And sometimes, uh, you know, you need to shake things up a little bit just mm-hmm. to kind of wake up, wake up the scene. And we managed to do that in a very short period of time. We basically the message that Makino Muerte was putting out is you know what, it's not safe anymore to just, you know, because there are still real people out here. You know, people still are really active out here, and you can't just do whatever you want. You know, you can, but your actions will have consequences, and it's like people thought they could just do, say whatever they want, go around, you know, bad-mouthing people, and, you know, so the scene got shaken up a little by us because our art is so powerful that people kind of backed off, and we're just like, all right. So, you know, we don't see a lot of the, uh, you know, we're not promoting any particular neighborhood or you know gang or this or that it's just uh we promote true realness you know right. be yourself and if you talk about that stuff then 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 by all means do what you got to do i think a lot of the stereotypes are funny like i saw that thing uh, there was a picture of snoop dogg and martha stewart and it said which one's the convicted felon right it's martha stewart <laughs> right right <laughs> you know well that's the one thing like i uh, for me it has worked to my advantage is that um you know, people, I have developed a reputation as a quote unquote, you know, real person, you know, and by that they just mean they talk about your street credibility and mine's intact, you know, right. that just means, you know, I'm not, a, you know, a confidential informant. I don't have a reputation of, right. <laughs> you know, having been a snitch in the prison system. Uh, you know, I'm somebody that has true life experience, put it in their music, and I only talk about real things. Everything that you hear on my album, or any album is 100% something I've lived through, you know, and that's why people can access my music and, you know, really relate well, to it. Well, art is about sharing a vision of truth 
the artist's truth to other people and communicating it the best way possible. Sure. Nevertheless, there's so many rappers out there that are promoting an image that they don't that they just can't live yeah, up. They're to. just into it for the money. P. Diddy. I wouldn't call um. that. I, I wouldn't really call that. You know that that art that kind of music art though, right? I mean, that's more just business but art's all subjective i mean sure. i listen you know it's yeah, like i listen I, so. I listen to some of this stuff and i'm like i just don't get it and i i mean they're constantly i see movies out there and i want people to really tell me i want them to go judah this is what it's because i'm missing something and <laughs> i'm like i'm really just i feel like sometimes i feel like i'm lost because well, I'm you not, know the notebook isn't for everyone the you notebook I mean? isn't for everybody <laughs> um so you have a new album coming out with your brother Right, the new album is called Times Is Hard. It should be coming out in the next month or two. There hasn't been a set release date. We're talking to the label about that right now. Um, a lot of my past projects are available on iTunes. Yeah. You know, we, uh, Space Cadillac, Last Known Photograph for Robert Paulson. My website's caddyron.com, C A D D Y R O N.com. And then Makina Muerte.com. For uh, that's like you know you can get updates about everything that the crew's doing and various members and stuff. So and your brother goes by Chris in the band. Or? My brother is Briefcase. Briefcase. Yeah, <laughs> that's good to know. Yeah. I need so, a nickname. How do you get a nickname? What do I got to do? You're, you're junk in the I got, trunk. Do I have to be homeless you're, for you're a year? Junk in the trunk. <laughs> trunk, in the trunk. Thanks and a lot, Judah. You got it. or a bear sash. Really, pick. Bear, sash bear. A sash right? bear. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that's actually a good name. <laughs> <laughs> in Hollywood, it's a great name. Yeah. And so you're gonna come back when this album comes out. You have you have you have, you have, you have tracks on it that you oh can play in God. studio. I have a few. Okay, yeah, so I want you and your brother. Who, you, your brother's just an amazing guy. Andrew and I both. Uh, he's oh, just, yeah. uh, he's, he, briefcase is great. And, uh, it wasn't always great. No, but. no, that's the amazing <laughs> thing is like, you know, that's the amazing thing. It's like you're sober, and I'm sure you get this a lot, and you got it from me. You know, you, you, you're, you, you're a good dude. You know, and like uh, you're, you're, you, you look like a good dude. You are a good dude. You try to walk the walk and talk the talk and do all those things. And it's like people sometimes probably have a hard time seeing you do the crazy. Right. And you're like, no, trust me, I did the crazy. And it's like <laughs> that's a hard thing about getting sober sometimes. I mean, I get people often all the time to say to me, I can't imagine you drinking. And I'm like, thank God. I can, and I don't. I don't want. You think don't about want it. it, right? But a lot of people, <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's the change that happens. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know. I think that's probably like my brother, my older brother got married to a woman who never saw him drink. Sometimes I think like she doesn't really know who he is, but fundamentally that's really who we are anyway. Because once we get back to our sober state of mind, that's the way we were created. The fundamental being exists within us. And, uh, you know, like people talk about looking at that picture of them when they were a child and just saying like, why can't I just capture that? Right. The happiness I had on the playground when I was three years old. You know, and I think the recovery process for me, I mean, I laugh more. I don't laugh when I'm getting loaded. You know, that's, right. it's not funny. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. We can laugh about it later, but it's not. Yeah. I mean, people don't want to be around me. And something, Andrew, you know, it's like you always say, it's like the loudest. You could the, you go to any restaurant, you could always tell the sober people because they're the, the loudest, loudest table. table in the restaurant. Yeah. Right. And you're right. Yeah. It's like I always hear people say that, too. It's like I, you know, I one time heard this guy, Scott Redman, God rest his soul. So he used to say something really cool and he used to go, this is the only disease that does the suffer. I think it was Scott Redman that they the only disease that alcoholism addiction is the only disease that leaves the sufferer in better condition than before they ha after than before they had it. Right. You know, it's like I'm I'm I has the potential to. Right. I'm right. If yeah. you get sober and you live a sober life. I'm so blessed because I was never happy before I picked up, you know. And a lot of that's because you have such developmental delays oh, through yeah. addiction. I mean, you know, you pick up young, you start using, and you don't get the chance to really develop uh, psychologically and in a healthy way. And so you've got to go back and reform all that stuff and start from scratch sometimes. Well, that's what I think and that deal, call And deal, have the character to deal with the trauma that you experienced while you were using. Ron, Ron, I'm sure there was a lot of stuff that happened to you out on the street and that was not pleasant. Yeah, I think, I mean, just... I mean, going to jail, and that's got to suck. When you wake up, I mean, when you finally wake up from everything, it's like uh, there's a lot to deal with, you know, and I hope mm -hmm. for everyone out there that's dealing with it, like, you know, get the help you need by all means, whether it's the 12-step process or therapy or something, because, I mean... Just thinking about all the stuff you go through on your own is probably not a good place to be in, you know. But and, uh, and that's why most people don't stay sober. I really have a belief I think of that. The, I think shame is the yeah. big thing that brings people out. You it's know? they like, can't they take just the can't pain. Take the pain yeah. and the and the shame of yeah. of all the consequences of what they did. And I always say to people, if you could make it through that, if you could make it through the pain, the shame, and all that stuff, that worst day, 
when you're like you all you want to do is crawl up in a you know and peel peel off your skin if you could stay sober that day there's a good chance you'll stay sober the rest of your life Mm -hmm. but most people go out and they relapse because that day comes and it's so painful that they go out people still get remarried no, yeah, that's, 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 that's a different, that's a different I get inside joke. Um, <laughs> so when's this out? So do you have a definite time for this album? We don't have a set date um, right at this moment. We just picked up the masters this weekend, so we're, we're celebrating a little bit. We put a lot into this record, and it's truly it's an it's an amazing piece of art. Um, I'm going on tour uh, February 15th throughout most of the Western United States, and uh, for anyone that you know could follow me on Twitter at Cadillac Ron. I'll be updating all the dates and Facebook, Cadillac Ron. How do you spell Cadillac? C-A-D-A-L-A-C-K-R-O-N. And people can go to uh, Facebook slash Clean Radio. There's links to your website Great. Uh, there. And it's also on cleanradio.com. We'll have links to everything. Totally. Um, and the show will be, you'll be able to see the video of the show on cleanradio.com on Thursday. Also, awesome. I encourage people to go back and take a look and there's links to your music videos and stuff like that. Great. So, and we're also uh, going to have you back in, you and your brother Briefcase, when the new album comes out and Sash Bear over there will be <laughs> playing some instrument. He can do a guest verse yeah, on he the can record. Do, right, and Jada the Uda will come in a little blinged Jada out. Jada the Uda? Yeah, that's my name. Jada oh, the Uda. Is that, is that even a name? Uh, what is that? It sounds I, like, I don't know. It sounds more Swiss than, Jew, than but, Jewish. Yeah, so. that's the whole, it's my bling <laughs> name. It's your bling. It's my holiday. Name. Wow. Yeah. And we have no street cred. Yeah, I'm going to get killed when I leave by uh, Cadillac Ronzo. Right? Yeah. They're like, <laughs> Kingdom Muerte is waiting for you yeah, outside. <laughs> yes. You lost the battle, Judah. I did. And uh, you're listening to Clean Radio Discussion. It's been a could, great show yeah. despite our technical difficulties. Yeah. Thank you all for hanging in there and listening to us. The co- and uh, you're going to, we'll be back next week. Uh, things will be back to normal. And uh, thank you for listening. The discussion continues on cleanradio.com suspect a loved one is abusing drugs? Call Clean Treatment Center at 888-601-6040 for a free drug test and consultation. A treatment advisor is available to help you administer the test and answer any questions you may have regarding treatment and more. We are here to help. Call us today at 888-601-6040 or find us online at cleantreatmentcenter.com for your free drug test and the start of a promising future.